Yeah. All right, Than, special guest again today, uh, and uh, this topic today is whole tank treatments versus biological control. And I'll read a statement here that you shared with me, which is in a large sc uh, scale uh, coral farm like Tidal Gardens, it's not possible to elbow grease problems away. It's too big for that. Uh, we have to rely on biological control and whole tank treatments. Get us all. Yes. Yeah, I got to tell you like, more of this is going to apply to the home environment than you think because a lot of people don't want elbow grease either or they want whole tank treatments yeah so. so when i was a hobbyist i was very much on the i want to do things as naturally as possible mm -hmm. i and also guys i started in like the 90s and the 90s were rife with ridiculous snake oil like half the products were just utter nonsense there still might be products that are nonsense now, but much less so than the 90s. It, it ruined, actually. Like, it made us all, you know, look for, like, we're on witch hunts all the time. You know, because it's just like, just like you just didn't believe what anybody told you. There was, a, there was a, a very, very popular product, and I don't exactly remember the name off the top of my head, but they literally argued that what, they, what this liquid was, was energy. Not like food source, but no, directly energy that you're adding to your tank. It's like witchcraft levels of nonsense. But anyway, so I wanted to try to do um, the, the most natural methods possible. And I was very averse to trying like a whole tank treatment because I thought it's very unnatural, it's very harsh, uh, and a lot could go wrong. But you know, once uh, my, my coral farm started to grow, I, there's just only so much you can do. And I almost look at it like uh, there's like a bridge in Michigan called like, the Mackinac Bridge. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard this anecdote, like when you start painting the Mackinac Bridge, it's so big that by the time that you're done, you have to start back over at the beginning and start painting it again. Oh, and that's kind of what this, what, what my tank started to feel like, where like in a smaller aquarium, I could you know, get in there, I could clean up a lot of the algae. And when I'm done, it's, it's a pretty good job. But even in just a 600 gallon tank, which is like the size of like my two biggest show tanks, I would do what I would think would, was like a lot of work. And then it was completely not impactful. Like I should have just not done it. Mm -hmm. And so one of my guys, he's more uh, open to doing a lot of these treatments and he's done several in his, his home aquarium. And so that's what got us experimenting with a lot of them and t with mixed results, but I would say overwhelmingly positive. There will always be some negative, I shouldn't say always, but most of the time there'll be some negative thing that happens. But the goal should be that the positive thing happened grossly outweighs that. Yes. Yes. Okay. So in that spirit, uh, we've got a handful of them here. Uh, we're going to go through that, you know, solve various problems at the global level. And we'll talk maybe a little bit about the good sides and the bad sides in that spirit, like what yeah. you could expect, especially like how it worked for you in a grand sale, but how they would work in a home environment. Because I've used some of these things too. So the first one is anti-algae. I got an algae problem. How do I solve this? And we're not talking about sucking out nutrients or anything anymore. Right. How do I, like, how do I actually you know, solve this with the hammer? And the first one is called fluconazole. Yes, it is. Um, oh, I, I wish I was better read up on this, on what exactly fluconazole is and what the mechanism of action is. But I believe it, uh, it blocks some sort of thing in algae that prevents it from spreading and prevents it from surviving, essentially. I think it's like you know, what Roundup does. You know, they're not the same thing by any stretch yeah. of imagination, but like a lot of these things work by preventing a biological, putting yeah. some, stopping something in the chain. Right, there's a, there's a biological pathway and this interrupts it at some, at some stage. Yep. Yeah. I, like, I'm gonna butcher this, maybe somebody can chime in in the comments, but I think like what Roundup does is like stops the, full, uh, the phosphate from being used. Okay. Right? Uh, in this case, I don't know what it is, but man, does it work. Yes. Um, and I would say that it is like 99% perfectly safe. The only thing that I've noticed, and this could be totally anecdotal, there's a million variables in these systems, right? But there's certain large polyp stony corals that will down color and just be mad for months. So certain things like um, 
certain platygyra, certain favia, things like that. So it's like these slower growing large polyp stonies will down color. So I should say that this is an off-label use, right? It's, I think it's used for like antifungal or something like that. Uh, but reefers have just figured out that it actually. Yeah, so, so some guy thought like, you know what? I'm going to put some random chemical <laughs> into uh, my tank. Let's knows? see what dies. Yeah. Like, and then it just, the, the number one was bryopsis. So bryopsis mm -hmm. for a period of time was a, like a plague problem in our hobby. You know, it's like a ferny. If you if you looked at it at first, you didn't know. You might think it's like some kind of hair algae. Look at hair algae on steroids. Yeah, and nothing, man. No nutrients will ever solve this problem. If you were wise enough to have tons and tons of algae eaters before there was a problem, you might never know there was in the tank. But after you have a plague, no amount of critters will solve this. Yeah, yep. it's it's not particularly appetizing to a lot of fish or snails or anything like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a it was. And it just like coats everything. Like, you know, we actually got it in the clownfish harem tank at one point in time. Mm -hmm. This is pre flu fluconazole. And then what, our solution to it was drain the tank to the bottom, man, and then use the little spray gun of hydrogen peroxide. Oh, wow, just to you oxidize know, it just, all? Just spray it on there and then fill it back up and then it would all be gone. But the little bits would be left. And then six months from now, we'd have to do it again, mm -hmm. you know? But it, like, it was really, really difficult to, to get rid of. Now, you follow the process, it's, it's gone in like a week. Yeah. You know, and ways. and strangely, like, I don't know, knock on wood, uh, we don't have a problem with pryopsis. And I, I, I say this and I, I just know that like next month we're going to have a problem. But um, the, 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 the typical algaes that we struggle with tend to be macro algaes. Mm. So uh, like there's two in particular, like Valonia, which is like the bubble algae. Okay. And uh, Ulva which is like a leafy lettuce that algae. Like that, does that sound like the calcifying algae? No, it's oh. actually, it's very, it's, it's a soft macro algae. It, it's, it looks quite literally like lettuce and right. it'll grow oh, okay, yes, like the yes. size of your hand if you yeah. let it. Um, so Ulva is such a weird thing to, for, for me because it is uh, considered a highly nutritious, desirable food source in like Japanese cuisine. Oh, interesting. It is also sold as like an algae uh, for fish. Okay. Like I, th I think uh, like a Two Little Fishies product is literally like a sheet of ulva. Yep. Uh, and so it's like highly, it's, it, it should be all the positive things, but it grows faster than most herbivores appetite. Oh, interesting. And now you have an algae problem suddenly. Well, I, so you said bubble algae in here. I've never used fluconazole on bubble algae. Does it work? I don't know if anything really keeps it down forever, but it, it, it definitely slowed it down to the point where other herbivores could like pick away at it. And then mm -hmm. eventually it'll, it'll come back uh, once you stop the fluconazole treatment. Okay, so now I'm gonna share one thing like the terms of good and bad. Right? Okay. Okay, so it's like anything, if you pulled a hundred people uh, out there, uh, anything that's a good product that's out there and people use, at least 80% of people have to have a you know, positive result. Otherwise it would get bashed into oblivion and nobody would ever use it, right? right? But there's always like this some portion between the 80 and uh, the 100% that will have various degrees of problems, you know? And so some people will use it and uh, like, I don't wanna say taint crash, but like some corals may kick the bucket and whatever. Mm -hmm. This is my theory as to why. So what we noticed is, this is one of the things you started to notice, like once we put the trident on the tank and you can monitor alkalinity and then like go look back at your graphs and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and like I made these changes and now I can see. Okay, so what we noticed was when we used the fluconazole, if you looked visually at the tank, it doesn't like look really all that much different. The corals don't look like they, you know, had, you know, really took an impact to their health, but they stopped consuming alkalinity right hmm. and so the dose of el the alkalinity starts to skyrocket because they're not consuming it as fast interesting right okay so our theory on that is basically that this fluconazole is affecting the zooxanthellae and the energy production because the zooxanthellae is an algae as well right it's mm -hmm. not killing it off and it, but it's affecting it in a way that it's not producing as much energy and that's why we're not getting as much calcification and the growth and why it's building up and so Basically what we've done is impact the animal's health with this to some degree, mm -hmm. right? But not in a way that would outright kill it. It's not rat poison. It's not gonna just kill things. But if you happen to have some coral in there that are already kind of at the edge, 
in a way that you might not be able to see with the human eye uh, or trained eye anyway. Maybe I pushed it over the edge in those cases why some of these people are having bad. They just have poorly maintained tanks. And the reality is, is if you're using something like this, sometimes it's the net result of some, at least 10% of the people who are using this, this is a poorly maintained tank. Mm. I have, you know, I'm, I'm using a magic cure, you know. Or they were redlining some sort of like really like cutting edge methodology where like the, the, the corals are already pushed to their physical brink and then you tried something like this and that was like the final straw or something. So if 95% of people raise their hands to this work for me and 5% say, no, it didn't, something about those five, right? Yeah, and could be. So think about your own tank when you're using it, but like that was our, our feeling on the matter is like, I found this to be true on a lot of things, by the way. Uh, if I increase the light period from you know eight hours to 10, the alkalinity consumption went up 20%. Those corals were absolutely growing 20% faster now. Wow. Right? And then if you turn to crank the lights up too high, right, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the alkalinity consumption goes down, you know, because I'm now shocking these corals. I, and so, like, if you follow the alkalinity on a daily level, it's like one of the, the best pulses of the actual health of this animal. Mm -hmm. right? is, it, is it being consumed? Yeah. You know, like, is it, did what you do help it calcify faster or slower? Whatever mm -hmm. you did yesterday. And there's nothing else that you could do in that kind of real time. But hmm. we saw that in there, in the Fluconso. But so for those of you that are running into, you know, algae problems, one of the things that we shared today is like, there's always a bad side to it. But you know what the worst side is? Is a tank that looks like crap is coming down and then everything dies. Yeah. You know? It turns out that algae can absolutely kill all your corals. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you use that in your systems to fight some algae. Yeah, and it's Instead a it's, of picking it out. Right, it's a, it's a periodic thing, and obviously um, herbivores play a, like a big role in this. So we we use snails, we use a few urchins, we use emerald crabs, and and various types of fish. The the most productive fish that we found uh, for for macroalgae ish, issues is like a fox face. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess I'm I'm talking about a situation where the level of growth of algae is more than any of these herbivores can handle. So in one of our tanks, I believe we have at least eight tangs, two fox faces, a dozen emerald crabs, and a hundred snails and, and urchins. Mm -hmm. And that tank grows algae so well that the, the, those herbivores can't keep up. And at that point, it's like, okay, we're gonna have to like drop the bomb on them now. And that's like the fluconazole, and the, that type of treatment. Hmm. Interesting. All right, so the next one here is uh, a, a hotly debated, interesting one, Vibrant, which we would now find out is, uh, at least at one point, is an algicide, right? Yeah. So it was told to us that it was a bacterial, bacterial solution. Thing. Uh, the, you know, hobby went out and challenged that in various ways and like came doesn't out there's an algicide. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be a, a bacteria thing at all. Yeah. And uh, I guess like there's uh, th this this specific algae side, it can be sourced for like much less or something. I think that's I think it's called LG Fix from API. At least theorized that it might be the same thing as LG okay. Fix from API. So I've so, never used it, so I don't so know. So controversy the of that aside, it does kill algae. <laughs> it does it really well, in fact. Because this is a conundrum for me, right? Uh -huh. Because like. We tested that stuff. We like did investigates and stuff mm -hmm. on it. I saw uh, it, and dude, there was no question. The stuff works, right? Yeah. And it works specifically on you know for one that that's really hard to beat, which is bubble algae. Mm -hmm. For me, in every tank that we've tested it on, you put that stuff in there. The algae, like uh, bubble algae, turns like a silver color, and then like just falls off. And on, like when it turns silver, they like start to eat it too, in a way that other uh, the fish didn't used to want to eat it and I can eradicate it from the tank in a way that never comes back, right? Mm -hmm. I like only product ever, right? But you lied to us. It, it is, it is that's, that's the sticking point, right? It's like, I can't support this. Okay, so I can't we, we don't sell it anymore. Uh huh. I would use it though. Yeah. I won't use, I won't sell it to other people because it was a lie, yeah. right? Uh, and, and I'll be frank, I'm still concerned about it because like the, label uh, I've, I've heard that you know it's being sold again okay uh, but the 
label hasn't changed. It still says it's all bacteria. But like the story it never was transparent or came out. So like what happened or why or what? So I can't sell it to people that trust me. Mm -hmm. But if you ask me whether I would use it to solve the bubble algae, the answer is yes, yeah. I would. It's, it's pretty good. It, it turns out that algicides kill algae, right? Who, who, who would have thunk? Um, the other thing that uh, is a noticeable, noticeable benefit from using uh, that type of algicide is on is is on a, is in a system with zoanthids, mm -hmm. because uh, like zoanthids can get like this like a very light film algae on them, okay, and it and it causes them to close, and they just can't like shake off shake it off. Interesting. But in the presence of an algicide, all of that stuff goes away, and you have like these big bright fluffy uh, zoas again. Okay, so that comes to mind, like, I don't know if this was the same thing, but I've had zoanthids that were closed and you couldn't get them to open up, and then you dip them in peroxide, mm -hmm. and you put them back in the tank, and they're just fine after that. Like, it's like magic, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, because uh, you're could zapping be, that, that foam algae. I always thought it was more of like a bacterial thing or something, but maybe it's yeah. that. I mean, I, I, I use algae, I guess, loosely. It's, it's, a, it's some biological thing that just coats them. And if you took like a... Like a yeah, yeah, if you took like a makeup brush, and you can just like very like lightly like brush them, and it comes off just like a like a peel. Oh, really? But who wants to do all that elbow grease, right? We're not no. here for that. So uh, that that's when like like the like these different algicides like really helped. And um, we haven't used uh, we haven't used it in a while, but maybe it's something that, that we might just like hop back into if we ever see that type of symptom again, because it was so effective at just making that go away. Like it cleans up, it, clean zoas grow 10 times faster than dirty ones. So you know how like some people have like phobias of like holes or whatever it might be? There's something about bubble algae to me that like just makes my skin crawl when I see it. I, I don't know, I don't know what it is. It just like looks so lumpy and gross. Some and, alien algae. Uh, yeah, and so, and especially like once it like, you know, starts to show up everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. It almost looks like it's like a cancer on the tank, you know, and so, I would use this to solve that a hundred times, man. Like, you, you couldn't stop me. You know? <laughs> I, I, yeah. So uh, you guys use this for a variety of different things. Uh, yeah. Is there anything else you? So you use it for the zoanthids. You may use it for bella. What else? You anything else? It, it it really comes down to a lot of that that the the bigger macroalgae type things. Yeah. I know some people were trying to use it for like dinos and diatoms and stuff too. Uh -huh. I get a little bit of mixed. I think there's better ways to solve that. But like, I, I know people were using it for that, especially when they, we thought it was bacteria because uh. you know, bacteria seems to be some of the solutions to that. But eh. no, yeah, not, not, not so much for us. No. All right. Antibiotics. This is one I just can't wait to hear your answer to. Uh, so. The first one is Cipro. What are you using antibiotics to control in the tank? Okay, so th I, I'm very new to this game. So this is like like two weeks ago new to this game. This is this is trailblazing, cutting edge, because I'm hearing it from other places too. So we've never, ever, ever like wanted to use a chemical uh, antibiotic in our systems. Like we run UV, and even that for us was relatively a, a new uh, adoption technique wise and, and ozone to some some lesser degree but like the the uh, and we would maybe do like an antimicrobial dip and like an iodine based thing and a disinfectant but never a whole tank treatment uh, again we, we've heard for some, some anecdotal evidence that it might be beneficial uh, specifically for things like anemones that can struggle with certain like bacterial issues uh, like hammers, torches, and frog spawn sometimes will have like a brown jelly type uh, infection. Certain um, like mushrooms, uh, like the like some Recordia yumas, things like that can as let me, well. Let's stop you right there. So, like I was running into this before, like with euphilia, like that brown jelly disease seems to spread, mm -hmm. right? And then I could put it in like a antiseptic or something like iodine, whatever, and it would kind of like bring it back, but it always comes back, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what I'm hearing is it's like a dip and stuff. People are dipping these things in antibiotics and they solve the problem. So not just kind of like setting it back, but making sure that this doesn't come back. But like if I have all of these corals in my tank, tearing them all out to dip them, mm -hmm. not a really viable option in many cases. And what if it's on the rock? 
Yeah. It's like, what like, if it's just in your plumbing it's or something? in the system. Yeah. You know? So you're saying you're considering dosing Cipro to oh, the tank. We dosed every drop in our entire facility already. Really? What did you see? So uh, we haven't gotten the results back, but there is a, um, there's a service that actually will do like a DNA test on, on the water and check for like bacterial levels. And we've only got the first batch of data back, which is our baseline. And then we're curious to see, like, because then we've set out subsequent samples. We're curious to see what, what effect the Cipro had at all. But anecdotally, we have noticed certain corals immediately respond positively. Like they might have been struggling for like up to a year and suddenly now they're, they're trending in the right direction. Things like Blastomusa and, and, um, and Micromusa lords, like acans, mm -hmm. like that, that sort of stuff has really perked up. There's a couple struggling Ganiopora, they're perked up. And what's really, really interesting is that there's corals that we didn't think had any issue whatsoever, but they're at least 20% bigger after doing this treatment. So something might have been bothering them. We just we weren't going to be proactive on trying to fix that problem. We just didn't think it was a problem at all. But clearly, it was. It was holding that thing back. Okay. So one of the things that uh, I, you know I've heard kind of going around the circles, and this is cutting edge stuff. So like, don't be part of the trailblazers if you want. Uh, but research it and, and listen and like see what's happening to other people. But we should figure out what the right doses and stuff are. But like, people are talking about using it on RTN. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you think about RTN, basically it's tissue necrosis, right? Mm -hmm. So if I had like a big ulcer on my hand that, you know, I'm losing tissue and you're starting to see my bone on the other end, then like antibiotics 100% are going to be part of this treatment. You know? Yeah, and we did have some, uh, and so for the folks out there that are kind of unfamiliar with RTN, we're talking about a specific pathogen issue with Acropora. Mm -hmm. And it's the wildest thing when you see it for the first time, because like you'll have a colony of Acros, and like the healthy portion of that acro is has fully it, it's full color it didn't brown out it's it is like peak coloration sometimes the polyps are fully extended but right where it's dying it is like the the flesh is just literally falling off the bone like it's like barbecue you know it's 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 just falling off the bone while the rest of it is in perfect glorious health and if you do nothing, it will be dead by tomorrow, the entire thing. Well, and sometimes like uh, if you cut it off, you could stop it, but not all the time. Not all the time, but you can, uh, you can save some of it. Yeah. yeah like it's kind of like, I mean, I hate to be morbid, but like my finger, like if that was happening to some degree, you just got to cut off the finger. Right? Yeah. But still probably going to use the antibiotic to make sure that uh, they'll get infection. Yeah. You know? And so we were, we were curious to see if like our our bacterial issues with um, with our acros would stop because we would have it, uh, the occasional colony just evaporate in that way. It's like, what the heck? Why? Why are you dead? Right. Um, and w w what's kind of like weird is that when we sent out the, the biological assay, mm -hmm. it didn't come back with any coral pathogens. <laughs> it didn't detect anything. Yep. So I'm like, oh, oh, oh kind of OK. Like Aquabiomics. Yeah. DNA testing? Yeah. OK. Yeah, so it's like okay, well, that that that's interesting that it didn't pick up anything because I'm 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 clearly seeing something happening here, mm -hmm. but but regardless, the the, um, the biological assay wasn't um, going to be a decision maker for us in any way, shape, or form. What was gonna, it's a it's a piece of information. It in is the puzzle. exactly what what was the thing for me was okay. We're going to try it on on some smaller systems here, and as long as it doesn't kill a bunch of stuff, we're going to do do this at scale. And so, yeah, we we are we just got done with um, the entire facility getting like one round of of like heavy flucon. Uh, I'm sorry, heavy uh, Cipro. Uh, Cipro treatment. Okay, so two questions, you know, for the Trailblazers, right? Where do you get your Cipro from? Uh, it, it was some website. Okay, so like it's it's not sold with a fish label on it, you know, like it's no, not, it, like, yeah, you it's, can't it's buy raw it. powder basically. Yeah, you gotta go. This is a DIY project. Right? Yeah. How did you find the right dose? Okay, so there is a general consensus dose that's out there. Okay. We heard from um, like a friend in the industry that they used five times the dose. And when they used five times the dose, everything in their tank looked nicer. 
this is like so off the reservation, guys. Yeah. But but yeah, he, he's five times the dose. And then all new additions to his tank now go through a quarantine, which involves a 5x dose of Cipro during that, uh, that, that treatment period. Mm -hmm. So we kind of split the difference. We'll try a 3x dose. And that's what we just had go through our systems. Okay, so if uh, uh, would you be willing to come back and post on this video the dose that you used? Uh, sure. For other sure. people, because uh, like, you know, maybe a little bit, just make a little post of like a couple of things that you guys did, because I think it'd be helpful for people to know. And, and I think everybody needs to hear that this is experimental to some degree, right? Like yes. you just try this. This isn't go do this. But if you're having problems that you can't solve other ways, experimental sometimes is the right way to go. Right. And, and in this case, there's no like normal biological control for something like this. This is you're you're talking about a whole tank treatment at this point. Yeah, the, there are problems. Like if I ran into brown jelly, like there was spreading again, I'd do this in a heartbeat. And I wish somebody had told me this back then. Yeah, cause, I mean, because like, uh, yeah, brown jelly is basically Ebola. I mean, it's so virulent and it's so aggressive. Yeah, uh, yeah you, you can't just wait it out. It's it's going to be a problem for a long time. You're just going to lose it all. Yeah, in a very expensive man. Yes. Yeah. Uh, or you're going to take it all out and treat it. But like, I don't know if you've really solved the problem because the stuff's still in the water, man. You know, mm -hmm. like I, I definitely have used a turkey baster and then you blow the jelly out and the ones next to it get it. You know, it was yeah. the worst decision possible. Yeah. Yeah. So once once we knew that that the uh, our initial experiments with it didn't outright kill the coral themselves, the, 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 the treatment didn't kill the coral. Uh, we were very excited about just like seeing if all of these other issues would just stop if we if we did this. And this might not be a, a, a one a one and done thing. This might be a a thing that we do like once a year or something to that effect. Okay, so do you have any idea? What, like maybe somebody out there that's really into this, maybe you know, why Cipro over something that's a little bit more readily available like erythromycin? That I don't know. Um, I like because sometimes the answer is very good. Like uh, that, like Cipro does this X Y Z so much better, and mm -hmm. why? Is, and sometimes it's just because that's what the three guys tried the first time, and we all followed that. Yeah. Also, uh, there, there's 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 some methodologies that involve multiple different types of antibiotics simultaneously. Um, and and I, I see it in dips. So like I think like Kung Fu Corals came up with like a methodology. So it's like the KFC dip method. And I think he uses like he uses uh, Cipro. He uses Chemiclean, which I think is erythromycin. And there's like a, a there's a couple other ones in that mix and iodine. Mm -hmm. And and that is a very aggressive, like all encompassing dip. Don't know if you need all that, but it, but it's in there if you needed it. And, and that's what they were using to like to dip a bunch of different types of like coral struggling with brown jelly. So as an experiment here, we ordered a bunch of torches, a bunch of uh, frog spawn and a bunch of hammers and stuff. And we dipped them in like we just made the recipe up, man. Mm -hmm. like which everybody did at one point in time. Uh, and I, I don't remember exactly how much we used, but the erythromycin from API comes in little tablets or something, right? Okay. And so I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know how much we use. I don't remember. But like, I, when we we it, when you do a dip for this, by the way, you have to rep, stop the replication of the bacteria. So you have to like, you know, outlive the way that it, you know, its life cycle. It's not just necessarily going to outright kill it. Okay. Right? So we did a bath in this stuff for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. You know. And what we found was that the, uh, you know, euphilia, like when it came out of there after 24 hours, it wasn't the happiest thing in the world, you know, but within two days in the tank, it was just fine. Oh, right? good. So good. maybe my dose was way too strong, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, my suspicion, if I just shoot from the hip here, is we used like something arbitrary, like one tablet for a gallon. Oh, okay. You know? like, <laughs> I, who knows? You know, yeah, that's a lot. That's uh, a lot, lot. Like, but I don't think anybody knows the right answer. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so how do we find the right amount? And, you know, it's going to be trial and error. Try, try again. Then we all try together. We learn something new. Mm -hmm. And there's always like the, the, the worry about like uh, developing antibiotic resistant strains of stuff. But I think that that's kind of 
that is the, the that is a part of antibiotics in general. That that's always going to be a risk. That's ridiculous. I, I like I, I hear what you're saying, and I hear why people would say that. But like, if the choice is uh, all my stuff's going to die or save it with this thing, save it is the right answer. Yeah. Like over a theoretical problem that maybe will materialize. Now there's some people that like there are red flags going off right now. But it's still like I would there's a reason why they use antibiotics in veterinary care. And this is what we're doing is veterinary care. We're mm -hmm. caring for these animals. We have to figure it out. And the reality is they don't treat, they don't teach this type of veterinary care, you know, uh, in a veterinary school. Not we're that I know learning of. it. Yeah, yeah. We're having to learn it. And so this is the only way that we find out. Mm -hmm. So is that a risk? Sure. But it isn't the reason we shouldn't do it. Yeah. Or it's like if, if we know that the 3x, 5x dosages are not lethal for the coral, maybe you, then, go, maybe you go hard uh, yeah. and make sure that that bacteria dies. Bam, use the whole thing. So that's yeah. part of it is we don't know actually the length. And so if you're actually thinking about you know, bacterial resistant strains, like we got to make sure that we make that bath long enough. And mm -hmm. like uh, we Googled it yesterday, actually. Oh, okay. uh, and, and it seemed I think that the average bacterial uh, life span is like nine hours. Mm. You know, so if you could span a couple of those, it's probably long enough. But like somebody who knows more about this than me you should chime in uh, in the yeah. comments and share. I think that the, the, the method that we used was it was an overnight treatment, basically a 24 hour full tank treatment three days over the course of seven full days so three different treatments over a week that's okay. what happened yeah, i mean i can't I wait triple the dosage i it just makes total sense you start piecing the puzzles together of why this would work and why i wouldn't necessarily do it all the time but why it's a solution to a problem that right. probably isn't as well known as it should be Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have to learn. It has to be the trailblazers going out to find out for the rest of us. Another one antibiotic, you said it is uh, oxolinic acid. Never heard of this. OK. I have not used this before and I had not heard of it until very recently. I guess this is a very popular antibiotic in like the koei fish industry for like ponds and stuff like that. It's like when you're having these ailments in these fish that Nothing else seems to make any sense. You use this stuff, and this stuff fixes it. Really? So it's a fish-related? But, but acid. people are using it now, experimenting for, for coral specific pathogens. OK. And so there's like a handful of people out there that have, that have given this a try. And it is basically um, a, a replacement treatment for Cipro. Like instead of using Cipro, you can use oxolinic acid. I don't know the dosage. I have not tried this yet, but um, in my in my pursuit of like uh, like antimicrobials in general, it might be something that we'll be dabbling with in the near future. Okay, so this one, next one is interesting too. Uh, so Google oxalic acid because I'm gonna. Uh, and the next one is uh, ChemiClean whole tank treatment for bio versus biological control. Okay, so what do you use ChemiClean for? So ChemiClean as a product is marketed for red slime algae, mm -hmm. but I believe that it, it is basically an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's made its way into some dipping procedures, and, it's, and certain folks have used it as a whole tank treatment and got good response from some like funky like, uh, like coral disease issues. So I threw that one in there because I think most people that, that would purchase that product are looking to deal with like red slime in some way, shape or form. But it does have some other side, I was about to say side effects, but side benefits that, that, that might help with coral health. So this one's interesting to me because like nobody knows what's in it. You know, like, I, I don't know, there's been, I've seen some science that uh, like, you know, I think it was maybe it was raining home farley or, you know, some people. I've heard you know, like, talk. Actually went out and found out what these things are. But like, I mean, they explicitly state mm -hmm. on the packaging, not an antibiotic. Yeah. And like, how could they get away with this for that long if that's true? I, I've heard things that um, they say that it's not erythromycin something. Ah, uh, sucking it or whatever right. it might be. But uh, the, that, that second part is the, is the key, not the first part. Uh, so I, not a chemist, guys, not a chemist. I just hear things. <laughs> that is an interesting 
you know, take. So just so you know, like, you know, like the EPA won't allow you to sell stuff that like kills anything, right? Unless okay. you like go through a ridiculous amount of effort, you know, Roundup or whatever. Okay, so that when you look at these things, there's a reason why they're called red stain remover. You know, it doesn't say gets rid of cyano uh, on it, even though that's what everyone uses it for. Because hmm. uh, they're like trying to skirt this thing. Okay, and then, I mean, if it was really that not erythromycin, so S, whatever, uh, and it's some other, like, what a, but it works. I, I don't know, this is another one, right? I feel like this. It, it, it does, uh, it does kill um, cyano. And so there's no question. So this is one of those things early on where everybody had told you if you use that, you're like a bad reefer. Like solve the problem, don't treat the problem and whatever. And like they're all telling you like use more GFO and all this stuff and stop feeding so much. Never once in all the time that I've been doing this, have I ever found anybody solve cyano by reducing nutrients. It might be the reason you ran into it, I don't know. But mm -hmm. I've never seen anybody solve it that way. Yeah, I, I um I don't have very many tanks that, that go crazy with cyano. Um, I've just noticed that it, it grows when there's like a pile of detritus sitting there in, a, in the corner and it grows on the pile of detritus. It grows in the garbage. Yeah, they see it in hard. So one of the things is like you say, people say high flow. Well, it could be high flow because you're actually just blowing it away or it could be just like the low flow places where the garbage is de deposited and that's where it grows on. But this one of the things that I've definitely experienced is that uh, use the red slime removers, the chemi cleans or whatever they are. And tomorrow that won't be your problem. Yeah. And I've never once had a negative result from it. I, I, I fully do appreciate the sentiment that you, that there's folks out there that want to do it without this and they, they view it as a crutch, um, or as like a, a, a reckless shortcut even. But sometimes like the, the, the all the natural alternatives are just not as effective or not effective at, at all. And this is something that could help them. Sometimes you just need to hit the reset button, right? Which is get rid of it and then let the natural alternatives win. Mm -hmm. You know, like, cause it's like, but the, the army of Santa is just too big. Yeah. You know, you're just like the natural things are not gonna be able to beat it. You know? Okay, so this is like a counter argument to the, the whole reset. Uh, sometimes when you, when you completely blast a tank um, and you do successfully like eradicate the algae or whatever it is that you're looking to, to eradicate, uh, what takes its place? Because there's like there's like a biological vacuum. There's like this open opportunity for something to move in, and you get the weird stuff at that point. Sometimes, yes. Yeah, and because it's it's a uh, we one time um, we we did some kind of like heavy treatment for something I forget, and um, the 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 following weeks we got the weirdest spiders mm. showing up, like these underwater spider things. And it's like the sort of stuff, it's like, well, perhaps the stuff that we had killed, all the, all the normal stuff, like the, the copepods, the amphipods and stuff, maybe those guys just ate their eggs or something at an early stage and you never have to deal with like alien spiders. Oh, but when you nuke your whole tank and you give, the, give these guys an opportunity to grow, suddenly you have spiders. Like, because we, we don't even, we don't acquire a whole lot of corals. It's not like, oh, we got a new batch of something or the other, it came on that. No, it was there from, from ages ago. Okay, so this is the part that, that's like kind of making me laugh internally here. I would use ChemiClean to beat the cyano like without any question. No, I, no problem. I'd, I'd, I'd recommend it to anybody who trusts me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, presumably let's just pretend it is really erythromycin. Right? Okay. Because I think they like, I think some of these things claim it's like some kind of sulfur or something. I don't know who knows. Anyway, if let's pretend that it was, you know, uh, erythromycin in there, wouldn't it be funny that this also turns out to be an off label way to do antibiotics in your tank and see the benefits that you're seeing? And instead of hearing this, like you're a bad reefer, you used it, it became this thing that actually was this thing that benefits everything in the tank. <laughs> It would be hilarious if that turns out to, to be the case. But in any case, the next one is a probiotic, uh, beneficial bacteria supplements. I, I mean, I'm on the edge of these. So uh, tell me about which ones or how you would use it or what benefit you get from so it. So this is super duper anecdotal. Mm -hmm. 
But in doing a lot of our anti our antibacterial treatments and stuff like that, we want to replenish the the populations of healthy bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we 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 didn't want to pick favorites. We just bought them all. We're numb. Mm -hmm. It just like mixed them all together. And um, I this is this is actually the first time I've ever done it. Because even when I, I, I would start a new aquarium, I would just I'd be happy to wait three months and just let the thing do its thing. And I wouldn't have put any bacterial supplements in there. But, you know, when, when I have like a, a running 2,500 gallon system or every single system is a 2,500 gallon system and I'm going to bomb out its biological diversity on purpose, I probably have better have like a plan B to like get that back up and running. Right. Mm -hmm. I have a lot on the line here. So we did this. And one of like the, the one, like the most miraculous like clear water happened afterwards. Really? Like the, the, the water got so crystal clear after we did. So this is such an anecdote, you guys. But it got like, it, it's like the first time you ever see ozone. Where it, like, mm. the, it looks like everything is just floating and there's no water in the tank. How did it get so clear? Right. And the only thing that changed from day one to like day two was that we put in these bacterial supplements. Where you been my whole life, ozone? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, 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 apparently this jug of like this nasty smelling stuff did something. It's pretty good. Okay, so I don't know that much about this other than some of the things you've heard, right? Mm -hmm. But talking to some of the people, you know, you got your products like, uh, you know, Dr. Tim's like Waste Away, you okay. know, you know, there's no question. You dose that stuff and then there's like areas, your skimmer will go nuts and the sludge will break down. Like, uh -huh. like there's stuff in here that is definitely eating other stuff, right? Uh, like so many people swear by Microbacter 7 from Brightwell. Mm -hmm. The Brightwell product. And then they have like a, another one like Clean or something, which is also like a more aggressive like the Waste Away. And then Dr. Tim's one and only, which is supposed mm -hmm. to do the like nitrifying bacteria. But like I have heard that some of the ones like the sludge ones and why you got to dose them is there are actually some of the same strains of bacteria that they dose to water treatment plants to break down all of the waste that goes down the sewer, right? Oh, really? Yeah, and so they are really aggressive uh, bacteria that breaks, rapidly breaks down organics, right? Okay. But they are not found in salt water, and so they can't replicate in salt water, and that's why you have to have to dose them. Oh, interesting. So they're not natural. Mm-hmm. But man, do they work? Very interesting. Yeah, again, not a microbiologist, but I can I can tell when the water gets clear. Like I can yep. give you that much of mm -hmm. an anecdotal. I uh, you know, there. so like that is one of those things too. Like uh, oh, so the, considering a natural uh, solution. Mm -hmm. So like uh, KZ will sell you uh, the like cyanoclean, right? Okay. Which they tell you is actually a natural bacterial which will outcompete the uh, cyano, right? Uh, and so you dose this stuff and it's not like chemiclean where it's gone tomorrow, but you dose it and it slowly just disappears from the tank, hmm. you know? And so like a much more like gentle approach to solving instead of the hammer, mm -hmm. okay? A lot of people don't like have the patience for that. You know, but actually the owner of Vibrant told me, you know, the debate about the Vibrant, but like told me one of the really pieces of great counsel is if it took you six months to get into a problem, it should take a couple of months to get out of it. You know, you shouldn't, or weeks at least, you know, you shouldn't be trying to like get out of a problem that took you six months to build up tomorrow. Like overnight all your, all your issues. Well, then it's like that reset bit that you just talked about, right? Like, well, once all that's gone, now the battlefield has been cleared. Mm -hmm. what's going to take its place. Right, you know, right. Instead, you know, with like the cyanoclean, I can just slowly let the thing I want to win, win. Mm -hmm. You know, now I like, nobody knows what's in, you know, these little blue bottles, you know, and, and I, all I know though, is if you look at the people that use them, they produce some pretty stunning tanks. Now it's a little bit of mad scientist. You have to be willing to do it all the time. But if you do that, there's some stunning tanks on the other side. You know, they don't have pests in them. The colors are insane, you know, uh, but like, man, you just kind of got to like let go and just, well, whatever bacteria is in there, you say is in there, must be in there, mm -hmm. you know? And I guess like one last little wrinkle I'll throw in about bacteria is that there's quite a lot of, of research studies 
about um, the role of bacteria in like in coral nutrition. Like a lot of what corals are eating are bacteria. And so we, we've just started with, you know, trying these different bacterial supplements. But I am curious to see how that impacts um, like certain corals as far as like, are, do they look like they're more extended in feeding, specifically acros? Mm -hmm. uh, because when, when we started to do aminos, it was very clear like, oh, they, they're responding to aminos big time. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if we're going to see something similar with, with bacterial supplements. You know, uh, similar to that conversation is like when we were doing those uh, aquabiomics tests, you know, mm -hmm. the DNA tests, like, again, you know, the snake oil bit we've talked about before is like, you know, the ocean direct thing, you know, uh, it says oceans, bacteria of the sea and whatever. And like, like A, is that real? B, does it matter? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, eh, I don't know. Okay. Well, in our experiments, like, the bacteria that came in those tanks was the exact same bacteria as the tanks that we started with natural sand uh, from the ocean and sand, uh, or from uh, actual tanks. And like it had those bacteria in it, man. It actually did. And then anecdotally, like we have added that sand and it solved problems in the sand. Hmm. You know, uh, in fact, uh, a friend of mine in his big tank showed me the area where he had poured, you know, the uh, ocean direct sand into the tank and the algae and garbage didn't grow on it. It grew in everything else. Right. Because it has wow. this like healthy biofilm on it where the other one is just like and nothing and, like the other sands, even though it says like live sand. You know, really what it is is fresh water and there's like basically a packet of Dr. Tim's almost in there. It's, oh, really? It's not Dr. Tim's, but it, like, something like, you that. know, in their reg alive, it's fresh water, you know, sand that has been dried, sifted out into the right side, and then they put it in a in the water. And then in there is a little bag of uh, bacteria. Oh, no, no, that's a bioclarifier. In the fresh water in the bag is cysted bacteria. OK, you know, but like it's it's not like from the ocean. It's something they added to the freshwater. It's been productized. Okay. Yeah. And, and it, it's not from the ocean. Whereas the, that ocean direct stuff, they uh, take it out of the ocean. They don't sift it. And for that reason, you'll have small parts and big parts and stuff. And they put it in a moist bag. Mm -hmm. and the bacteria from the ocean survives in there. And I got to tell you, the DNA testing and all the anecdotal results say yes to the point that I would use it every time. And we even used it to try to prevent prob or treat problems. Wow. You know? So in the uh, spirit of using a probiotic to solve problems, man, it could be something as simple as uh, mm -hmm. sand or even using established media. Right. So we have added media from established systems to tanks and it has helped them, you know, hmm. beat things that like would otherwise like be overrun, you know? Okay, next Very one. Interesting. Anti-crustacean. I've never used this one before. Oh, it's so good. Okay, tell me how you use Interceptor. Okay, so Interceptor, I, okay, I'm gonna butcher the, the name. It's like millisieve oxide or something like that. It is a heartworm medication for dogs. Mm -hmm. and, the, and you need like a, a vet um, prescription for it. Because from what I understand, when you um, when you kill the heartworms that are that are plaguing your your pupper, uh, the dying worms will leave holes and the, and the the dog can bleed out through his heart. Oof. So it's like it's kind of an involved thing, right? So, but yeah, it is basically like this. Um, well, it's kind of like flatworm stop in our tanks, where if you use all that, when they all die. Flatworm exit. Yeah, flatworm yeah. exit. It can, you know, wipe out a tank. Yeah. You know, just for if you if the infect infestation is too big. So I, again, I think it, I think it is it is it for heartworms or, or is the heartworms the problem that you that's when that's why you need it. Regardless, it it, it is a it is a vet only medication, mm -hmm. and originally it was used in home aquariums for specifically for red bugs on acros. That's the only thing I've ever heard it used for. Okay, so here's the thing, guys. Red bugs is like, like a tier ninety problem. Like, they're, if you're if you're having an issue with your acros and it has red bugs, it's not probably not because of your, probably not because of red bugs. That's why you're having problems. It is like barely a flea on these corals. Like, it's it's not 
actively getting munched down like if it was a acro eating flatworm like that's a problem but anyway like the, people got it into their minds that like they needed to absolutely eradicate all these little uh red bugs that are on i acros. remember back 20 years ago everybody was pulling their all their acros out destroying their tanks trying to dip for these things and or, yeah or adding this stuff you know like quarantining them but there are crustaceans that are bothersome and not necessarily red bugs and uh so we started to, to uh, like, uh, we, we do a lot of like ultra macro photography and videography on our channel. Mm -hmm. And it's like looking at stuff under a microscope. You look harder, you're going to see more things. And I guess like some of the things that we were seeing are like weird, like a little like ciliates. And, and these things, I would say, are on the order of one tenth the size of a red bug. So red bugs are already difficult to see with the human eye. You cannot see ciliates with your, with your naked eye. And so I'm like, and part of me is wondering, okay, is this part of the natural biome of a healthy coral? Because by the way, our coral, our acros that we saw those things on have never looked better. They were like gloriously colored, big, bright, open polyps. Okay, never seen better specimens, but they had ciliates. So I'm thinking, we might be messing up, but we're gonna try to kill everything. Mm -hmm. And so we went to Interceptor first. And Interceptor, is such an interesting thing because it basically nukes all your crustaceans, Copopods. all your amphipods, amphipods copepods, uh, not your snails, but it'll kill like hermit crabs, shrimp, uh, like any of those things. Yeah. But it'll kill all your little, all the micro, 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 micro stuff. And what we what we saw were corals that didn't seem to have any problems at all suddenly look amazing also. So it's like, oh boy. There's, so maybe there's just like some undetected little crustacean issue going on and I've, just fixed it. I've talked to uh, another farm. That, okay. And now I forgot about this conversation because it was like seven years ago. Uh, that they uh, use the same thing for um, what they would call parasitic copepods, but basically unknown parasites they just use this stuff periodically to set all that stuff back mm -hmm. you know uh and they would also use like a utilitarian fish so they would add mandarins and stuff mm -hmm. not for the purpose of looking cool but to eat these things mm -hmm. you know and you think of all pods must be good but there are parasitic ones there are and actually a, a lot of pods are they, they can be problematic in their own ways like I've had regular amphipods, I got the ones that look like little bunnies, mm -hmm. just like go insane and just eat cucumbers, oh, like really? sea cucumbers. Oh, like weird. they would, you'd, you'd sit perch onto a sea cucumber and where that thing is, you'd see like the sea cucumber go, go like this. Oh. I'm like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I, I, so a, a lot of like the, the bugs in our tank, I don't think that most of them are, are necessarily bad, but sometimes like when you just, when you, when you just re hard reset all that, um, there, there were certain things, uh, I mean, in particular, bubble tip anemones, they, 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 they were four times the size the next day. Really? Out in, and we weren't treating for them. We were, we were looking at our acros, but yeah. they happened to be in the same system. And then the next day you have these like ginormous bubble tip anemones. And we're like, huh, apparently something was bothering you guys. Cause, uh, just for your, your, uh, knowledge. You can go, the reason that it's behind the counter of the, the you know, veterinary uh, or veterinarian is because they want to make sure your dog doesn't have these the flatworms before they give it. It's a preventative yeah, thing. Yeah, okay. Because if you have it, uh, if you just went and bought this and they had it, you'd kill your dog, like you said earlier. Yeah, yeah. So it's not I like- I might have spoke earlier. Uh, it's not like a controlled, you know, it's like, product or whatever mm -hmm. uh so when you go to them and say hey i need this for my fish tank like you probably won't get a lot of hassle right yeah uh, yeah I, i've never heard anybody had to get a hassle about it so uh, i think that i think you even used to be able to get it direct from like uh online places if you had the yeah. right you know. i i think nowadays uh, as long as your vet signs off on it you can just order it online okay yeah, yeah. i think that's how that works all right so get a vet yeah, yeah. yeah. Find a vet that's down. 
Yeah. They'll take care of you. <laughs> I, I don't think you get a lot of pushback if you wanted to try yeah. it. Is the point, but uh, it probably won't ever be available. Like you just like go buy it from wherever, whenever you wanted to. Yeah, but I I love the stuff. So how often do you use it now? Um, well, so the the reason why this we goes totally against what everybody thinks. Like you're wiping out your pod populations. Tell it sounds terrible. Out of here. <laughs> yeah. Get rid of those pods. Um, so like the reason why I I don't do it more often is because we we do like to use like peppermint shrimp, cleaner shrimp, emerald crabs, and stuff like that. And you got to go round you know round up all those guys because interceptor will absolutely kill the hell out of those. Uh, so we didn't want to just you know, just be killing these poor shrimp and stuff like that that we put in there. And so uh, eventually we just kind of like stopped using Interceptor. But now we have a system where we can literally take all the corals out of, out of a tank that we're doing. So for, for instance, it could be like several hundred gallon like systems. And we can house those corals overnight and then do the dip of Interceptor overnight into, in that separate container. And so uh. we don't have to like bomb out an entire tank completely recklessly. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I've wavered on pods like, it's so funny because it's just like, you go to both ends of the spectrum over and over again, so Poppy mm -hmm. does. And like, I always felt like pods are just gonna make their way in the tank one way or another. Yeah, they'll, they'll come back. Yeah, uh, it's fine. Uh, you know, there's probably pod eggs in there that mm. like will uh, you know hatch after your interceptors you know depleted or whatever. But there's one specific type of crustacean that I that I do want to get rid of though, and uh, I forget what the scientific name is, but it looks like a mini mantis shrimp. Okay. Like a really, really, really tiny baby mantis shrimp. Um, and what they do is they make like a mucus tunnel, like a mucus web tunnel, but they grow like if this is my coral, it'll grow right up against their flesh okay. and cause it to recede. Oh. And, the, and they, they, they replicate like crazy. So they're all over the rocks and they make like this, like a swirling mucus web design. But it's basically these little crustaceans and they make these, these mucus tunnels and then they kind of choke out your corals over time. Hmm. And... Interceptor deals with them <laughs> big huh. time. Never seen that. All right, want to see some more Than? Uh, well, our special guest uh, playlist is right here. Uh, we've got more to come.